Today on CyberWork, Dr. Richard Ford of Siren walks us through the job of malware analyst. You'll learn all about breaking into the field, learning whether a computer science degree is or isn't essential, and Richard tells us about the early program he wrote to brag about his high score to his classmates. That's all today on CyberWork. Also, let's talk about our new hands-on training series. It's called CyberWork Applied. Tune in as expert InfoSec instructors and industry practitioners teach you a new cybersecurity skill, then show you how that skill applies to real-world scenarios. You'll learn how to carry out different cyber attacks, practice using common cybersecurity tools, follow along with walkthroughs of how major breaches occurred, and more. Best of all, it's free. Go to infosecinstitute.com slash learn or check out the link in the description and get started with hands-on training in a fun environment. It's a new way to learn crucial cybersecurity skills and keep the skills you have relevant. That's infosecinstitute.com slash learn. And now, on with the show. Welcome to this week's episode of the CyberWork with InfoSec podcast. Each week, we talk with a different industry thought leader about cybersecurity trends, the way those trends affect the work of InfoSec professionals, and offer tips for breaking in or moving up the ladder in the cybersecurity industry. Dr. Richard Ford is the Chief Technology Officer of Siren. He has over 25 years experience in computer security, working with both offensive and defensive technology solutions. During his career, Ford has held positions with Forcepoint, Virus Bulletin, IBM Research, Command Software Systems, and NTT Vario. Dr. Ford has also worked in academia, having held an endowed chair in computer security and worked as head of computer sciences and cybersecurity department at the Florida Institute of Technology. Ford holds a bachelor's, master's, and doctor of philosophy in physics from the University of Oxford. In addition to his work, he is also an accomplished jazz flutist and instrumental rated private pilot. Uh, quite a, a well-lived life there. Uh, while we like to cover all aspects of the cybersecurity landscape, at the heart of the show is that we want people to know the nuts and bolts of different cybersecurity job roles and careers. Uh, Richard's been a malware analyst and manages teams of malware analysts and has agreed to come on to talk about what it's like to be a malware analyst uh, in 2021. So Richard, thank you for joining us today on CyberWork. Well, thanks for the opportunity, Chris, to talk about something that I love. That's oh, great. Glad, glad to hear it. It's uh, you do do what you love, and uh, every day is a every day is a treat. So, uh, so well, I I've, I gave you a little bit of your your bio here, but I like to start with the origin story. How did you first get involved and interested in cybersecurity? You've been at it for a long time, and I know you went to school for physics, but you moved over to technology and cyber pretty soon after. So, what was the attraction? Yeah, so I love the question, the origin story, right? I feel yeah. like I'm now a character in MCU. I Absolutely, my, that's my, yeah, my, that's that's the idea. We want to we want to hear about uh, what it was like on Krypton, yeah, <laughs> 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 or you know, yeah, I, I, that was a DC reference. I realized, but okay. <laughs> well, I'll forgive you. But, um, <laughs> yeah, so as a kid, I was always fascinated with computers, and back in those days, there were no real PCs, right? Right. So I had a Sinclair Spectrum. Uh, mm. If any of you grew up in England will know what that was. I think they were yep. sold under a different brand, but they were sold in the U.S. too. Okay. All 16K of memory. Woohoo! This is so. This is around the time of the Commodore 64, then, or yeah, like exactly that, that right. kind of era. Okay, that was my that was my first rig. Yeah. Commodore 64, Vic 20, you know, Vic 20, yeah, right. Okay. Um, and uh, okay. I used to love playing games on it. Oh yeah. So nobody believed me when I when I would go into school and say, "Look at my high score." And there was no way to save your high score because they, they were loaded from cassette tapes, right? Yeah. Not oh, yeah. copy discs, no yeah. score catching, no nothing. So, uh, you know, 12 or 13 years old, I decided I was going to write a program that would capture the screen and save it to tape so I could then load it when people came around and said, wow. I'd, I'd, I'd done well at this game. And that got me into a very interesting world because these games were copy protected. And so when you tried to run something alongside them, they wouldn't run, they wouldn't load, they wouldn't start up. And so I learned assembly with the sole goal of getting around the copy protection, not to steal the game, <laughs> but to be able to take a picture of the screen and save it back to disk. Um, and I suddenly discovered that I was more interested in how computers worked than playing the games. And that was a sort of pivotal point for me. So I went off to university to study physics. And what you'll find if you talk to a lot of people my age who are in computer sciences, especially security, is we don't have computer science degrees. It's mathematics, philosophy, physics, right. because computer science degrees were much rarer then. They, they, they weren't as big. So I'm the sort of last generation of computer scientists who came up with a different education. Right. And... Um, even during my PhD, which was in you know quantum physics, 
Um, I spent more time writing computer code. So I was automating experiments. We took an experiment that took, you know, hours and hours and hours to take the data, plot the data, analyze the data, and turned it into something that would plot it and analyze it in real time. Um, and in those very early days, Oxford University was just getting on the internet. So I sort of fell in love with computing. I was really a computer guy living in the physics department. And one morning I turned on my computer and it sort of made a complaint at me in Spanish about the phone tariffs in Spain and then rebooted and wouldn't run. I'm like, well, that's different. Turned out I got a very, very early computer virus, Spanish Telefonica. Wow. And so I wrote a little article about it and this article got out and I got a call from Virus Bulletin. And they called me up and said, would you like to see how it's really done? I said, sure, I'll come on in. And they offered me a gig disassembling viruses for them for cashy money when I was a student. And the rest is history, right? Yeah. From, you know, you're going to pay me cash to do this? Sure. Yeah. Sign and, me up. and learn at the same time. Mm -hmm. Learn something you wanted to learn anyway. That moves nicely into my next question here. I wanted to talk about your your early days and especially your work doing, you know, malware in the 90s. It's, you know, you were the anti-malware researcher at IBM way back in 1996. Now, you know, for me, I was in college from 92 to 96. And I remember getting my first, you know, virus or malware around 99, 2000. So, I mean, you know, and it was really a surprise to me. So I'm, I feel like I don't think of malware as being something that was that prevalent or talked about so far back. So can you talk about the malware landscape in the night, you know, the mid nineties and how it's changed in intervening decades? Yeah, it was crazy. I remember my first DEF CON. There were like a handful of people in a room, you know, it was like DEF CON three or something. Maybe there were, it was literally a handful of people and I knew a bunch of them. Um, the virus scene back then was really interesting. Because people were sort of exploring, there were people, people weren't doing it for money, they were sort of almost explorers. Now they were causing chaos, right? And they were hurting people. It wasn't really their intent, mostly. They were sort of trying to figure this stuff out. But um, it was all boot sector viruses, file infecting viruses, and people exploring the consequences of connecting computers together. So we were starting to see worms, um, Trojan horses. So. It, so it was interesting and it was so easy to get at people, you know. So I remember sitting down to interview John McAfee in San Francisco on one of my first gigs as a reporter going out into the field. It was a field. lively talk, I'll bet. <laughs> oh, it was fun. Yeah, John, yeah. John was a hoot, you know. Yeah. We sat down and I think it was the San Francisco Marriott and um, just, just talked about malware, talking to Alan Solomon, talking to all these people who became super successful uh, in the industry. And it, it's a family. So I've got friends yes, yes. now that I, I've known for 20, 30 years through the, through the anti-malware world. And, and it's that group of connections that has sort of seen me through in my, my career. Now it's changed, right? So now it's all about blood. Back in, back in those days, it was more friendship. Now, when I say it's about blood, I mean, that, that's between attackers and defenders. So we see nation okay. states getting in there. Yes, we yes. see organized crime getting in there. We see that, you know, big sums of money are being impacted by malware. Back in my day, it was, I'm going to draw a picture on your screen. Oh, yes, you know, yes. I'm going to format your hard drive. Woohoo, right. that was funny. Um, and uh, that change is, is interesting. It's it's also interesting to note, by the way, that there's a lot of what I would call co opetition in the industry still. So of, of my old friends, it doesn't matter which company they're at. If they call me with a malware related question, I'm still going to help them out. We still trade samples with each other. If somebody needs a sample of something that's in the news and they have it, we'll exchange that sample. I'll give them a leg up on my disassembly, whatever it is. And so, yeah, it's a really nice community at the, uh, hmm. especially among the old school folks who've been there for a very long time, but yeah, the community yeah. itself, the threat, completely different. It's gone from joyriding, you know, it's like the difference between joyriding and ax murdering. It, yeah. it's, it's pretty yeah. nice. I was also just curious about how the, how it's changed in terms of uh, complexity. Cause you know, I always think of sort of malware and anti-malware as being this kind of arms race where, you know, maybe the earlier L malware wasn't as complicated, but there weren't as many sort of safeguards in, in the way, you know, to sort of keep it at bay. Whereas now like, you know, just the defenses get higher and higher and therefore, malware just gets more and more virulent and strange as, as ways of sort of like bypassing things is can you sort of talk about that that change yeah, over the years? So, 
So back in the day, I remember the first time I saw a polymorphic virus. And, and for those of you who aren't into viruses, a polymorphic virus is just one that looks different every time it replicates. Mm. Same code, but it lays out differently. It's packed differently. And we were all like, oh my goodness, you know, the sky is falling. Now we have server-side polymorphic trojans that are just a nightmare that use, that use the internet to update themselves, you know. So the, the levels of complexity yeah, it's night and day. Of course, we have better tools now, too. Right. So back then, we would often have to build our own tools. Now, you can go online and get hold of Oli Debug or IDA Pro, and you're using the same tools the pros use. Um, so viruses have got infinitely more sneaky. There's a lot more evasion. They burrow down into the operating systems. The operating systems are much more hardened than they used to be back in the old MS-DOS days. Anything right. Could write to any other thing. Now, you know, you have to evade all these defenses, but you have so much more space to do it. I remember when 4K was a huge virus. And mm -hmm. now, you know, these things are tens of meg in, at times. So the, the complexity is, is night and day. And it's hard to draw a border around something too. So what do I mean by that? Back when I was looking at malware, when I was first in the industry, I've got my piece of malware and I'm examining it. Now it's reaching out and it's getting updates through command and control, you know? So these things are dynamic, they morph, they're monetized. You rent space on a hostile computer or a computer you've taken over. So it's crazy more complicated now than it was. Yeah. Okay. So um, going back to your, your career, uh, you know, obviously you started out in, in malware and you were excited about malware. Uh, can you talk about some of the major career and personal milestones that brought you from these early jobs up to being the CTO of, of Siren? Like what, what were some of the major projects or responsibilities or studies or certs that, you know, got you from point A to point Z here? Yeah. So I'll start with the, the thing I used to tell my students, because we'll touch on the fact that I was a professor for a while in the middle of all this. Mm -hmm. So um, I would always tell them, make your plans, but hold them loosely. This is not a life story I would have written. If I was if I was orchestrating my life, this is not the set of coincidences that that you would believe, right? I, I grew up as a relatively poor kid in England. Um, by the grace of of good fortune and great teachers, you know, managed to get into the University of Oxford. I scraped my way in um, and was, you know, I was the dumb kid in class when I joined. Right, first time I saw a differential equation. I felt very proud of myself because I canceled the D's, right? And I'm like, uh -huh. well, that's simpler. Uh, um, <laughs> I got and, this. <laughs> uh, I wish I could tell you I was kidding as well. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I got into security and, and each job just kind of came along. And I think the trick was be curious, be friendly. Climbing up the ladder doesn't mean pushing people down. I'm not taller because you're shorter, right? right? So I helped a lot of people along the way. And guess what? Karma is wonderful. They've helped me back. They've mm -hmm. they've made introductions for me. I can you know pick up my phone and call one of a dozen researchers and say, "Hey, can you help me with X, Y, or Z?" And the answer will be yes. Um, the big milestones. IBM Research was probably the most amazing place I've ever worked. Um, mm -hmm. Smartest people I've ever hung out with, doing the most interesting stuff. Um, just crazy times. Um, you know, running running IBM antivirus quality assurance, trying to build the IBM computer immune system. It, it was an incredible journey. I fought going into management for a long time, right? And this is a, a, this, this is a decision everybody needs to make in their career. When do you go from being an individual contributor or a researcher to being a manager? Because normally your step up the career ladder is moving further and further away from what I call the metal and more and more into managing the people. Yep. I fought that for a long time. I'd probably be wealthier if I'd gone into management earlier, but I'm not certain I'd have been happier. Right. Um, I enjoy managing people, but I, I love to still occasionally roll up my sleeves and write some code. So IBM was a big deal for me. Um, Vario, Vario NTT was a huge deal um, because I joined a, a, a small company that ended up ultimately getting rolled up and sold to NTT for what, like 5 billion, I think. So was, that was a good experience, um, taught me a lot, taught me about the internet. So the reason I went to Vario NTT, at the time it was called Highway Technologies, is I wanted to learn, I knew that the internet was going to be a huge deal. Um, I knew security, I knew viruses, but I didn't know a lot about, you know, the underlying protocols that ran the internet, BGP, TCP, IP, all that good stuff. 
So I'm like, oh, I'll go get a job at this web hosting company. I'll learn all about internet security and that should prep me for later in life. I didn't expect it to be the really good run that it was for me. So that was very important because it introduced me to some wonderful people. Um, the, the founder of Highway Technologies, the CEO, took me with him when he left to be CTO of a venture fund. So I was, mm. you know, I learned the business side of the world from him. So now I've got malware, internet security, and business. And those things um, were just a great sort of primer for me to, to have a sort of broader remit in life. Uh, that was the point where I decided to make a career change, go into teaching. So at the end of all that great run, peak of the NASDAQ, I remember Scott, my, my CEO friend, telling me, what, what, when were you happiest? What do you want to do now? I said, I don't know. I think I was happiest when I was at university. He said, well, why don't you go make students? So I did. And for 10 years, so like another big career change, right? I gave up that corporate world and went to become a professor and then endowed chair and then department head and then found an institute at the Foreigner Institute of Technology. And that institute, I'm very proud to say, is, is still doing extremely well, um, you know, and, and going from strength to strength to strength under the management of one of the guys that I hired to be at the institute. So, you know, it's still sort of spitting out students. And, and from there, getting back into the game, it was a former student and also a friend who, who called me up one day and said, hey, Dr. Ford, you know, Raytheon might be buying WebSense. How do you feel about, you know, helping sort that all out and securing their technology? And I said, well, you're going to have to stop calling me Dr. Ford if I'm going to work for you. Right. He said, okay, I will, Dr. Ford. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and that got me back in. And, you know, I had, I had several happy years at Force Point. But the point is none of those things fit together. Right. Um, yeah. And yeah, I, don't think, I don't think you can plan that far ahead. You just have to sort of go with right. the current. And I think I'm, I'm glad to hear that, too, because, you know, we, we, you know, you're, I think, my 133rd guest on the show or whatever. And I've had lots of people who are in, in C-suite positions, you know, and I ask them this question, you know, uh, what's it like to move into a management position? If you do, you ever get sad that you don't get to do the work anymore? And most of them will say, well, no, that's just part of the natural progression. You got to you got to let things go. You know, when I was a you know, child, I thought as a child, blah, 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 you know, but I'm like, surely some people must still want to do the work that they got into the oh, yeah. to do in the first place. And so I'm, I'm glad you're here, you know, saying this, Richard, because, you know, I think people need to hear that if you don't want to stop doing the thing that you liked, you don't have to, there's other ways that you can sort of like make lateral moves or, you know, sort of keep your, your head in the game. It's not this, you know, like, Oh, you got to put your toys away. Now it's time to be a grown up and, and manage other people and things like that. Yeah, I think it can be hard, but it can be done. And, and I got to give some credit to the companies. Mm -hmm. Companies are getting smarter about okay. saying, hey, this, this guy or this gal is an awesome engineer. Why should I take them away from what they're really, really good at? So they make these sort of fellows tracks, right, where yep. you can sort of take become an engineering fellow in a, in a company, which allows you to continue on that technical track and do what you love. And right. so I think that companies are figuring this out, and that's very encouraging. Yeah. Now I want to uh, go from there to the, the main subject of our, our topic today. You know, as I say, the cyber work is all about cybersecurity careers and how they work and how do you get into them. Uh, and I've been looking for someone to talk to us about malware analysts for a while now. And, and you said, you know, I don't actively do it now, but I, I run, you know, I, I manage lots of malware analysts. And, I, and as you say now, you like to sort of uh, keep your hands in the game and stuff. So uh, I, I want to just hear all about it to, to get right at the beginning here what are the roles and responsibilities of a malware analyst in 2021 so i think there are two flavors of malware analysts let's start with that there's the the guys and gals that work inside the cybersecurity industry mm -hmm. right so they work for a vendor and then there are very large enterprises vles that have their own SOC that also have malware analysts in-house and those jobs actually look somewhat different they share some similarities but they have some pretty big differences as well. So let's talk about the similarities. At the basic level, what a malware analyst does is they, they do a lot of reverse engineering of malware. Mm -hmm. so, so some attack will come in, some machine will get compromised, and they're going to look at the implant on that machine, understand what its indicators of compromise were, what did it do, did it open any other back doors, how did, what was the infection vector, and then your job diverges. So if you're in the industry, you're mainly focused on how do I detect this thing? How do I stop it? How do I automate detection of this? 
So one of the big things in industry is that I don't, you know, we're dealing with millions of infected files a day. In fact, millions of different bits of malware every single day. If I had to have people look at that, I'd have an army of people. And I couldn't afford it. And your malware soft, anti-malware software would cost you a thousand bucks a seat, right? Yeah. So how do we do it? We deal, we do it with automation. And so my malware analysts, not only there, there's a continuum, right? As they get more and more senior, as they progress in their career, they start off, I'm writing signatures, writing signatures, writing signatures. Okay. As they progress, it's, I'm looking at things that are more interesting. And then it's, I'm looking at detection techniques that fit well with this family of malware that lets me detect this stuff more generically. Now, in an enterprise, you're not so focused, you're not focused on writing detection signatures. What you're focused on is working with the rest of that SOC team, the incident response team to go, what was the impact? So you might get teamed up. You might get teamed up with a network analyst. You might get teamed up with the incident response team. You might get teamed up with the SOC itself to see, to see what's going on. So at the end of the day, you know, the basics are the same. I'm pulling apart malware. And, and that's finicky and it's tiring and it's fun. Um, but what you do with it, the output's different. In, in my industry, it's I'm all about detecting not just this bit, because detecting the piece of malware that's in your hand is easy. Detecting all its brethren, that's hard. Okay. Um, so there's the detection aspect. In the company, it's more the investigational aspect. So it's what are the threats that are going to come against me if I'm Bank of America? What are, what are the threats that are going to come against me if I'm Wells Fargo? You know, what, yes. what impacts me? What was the impact of this in my environment? And so the career paths also look sort of very different too. Yeah, that's that. I mean, that, that's that. That leads nicely to my next question about, uh, you know, especially if you're just starting, like what combination of skills, backgrounds, experiences, certifications, or other qualifiers make up a good malware analyst? Like if you're looking for people, uh, you know, to to fill these early positions, like what what do you need to see on their resume? That, that's a toughie, right? Because mm -hmm. ideally, I'm going to hire somebody with a computer science degree. Yep. Somebody who has low level assembly experience. Um, and, you know, somebody who's shown and demonstrated interest in security. At the low level, entry level, you don't have to have a, um, a certification of any kind, mm -hmm. necessarily. What's more important is, are you super keen? Are you inquisitive? Are you a good people person for a mm -hmm computer scientists, right? So we have the stereotype about computer scientists. Yeah. I, I, I think, <laughs> yeah. So I think, um, you know, I'm looking for low level skills, it, not necessarily in security though. I'll take somebody who's really curious about how things work. I right. think if you understand, if you want to understand how things don't work, you have to start with understanding how they work. So when I used to have PhD students, I very often start them off by reading the RFCs, the sort of fundamental rules of the road for the internet. And they'd say, Richard, this is really boring. Um, but, you know, it's like being the karate kid, right? It's wax on, wax off. Yes. Once you really understand how TCP IP works, now you can use it. Now you can see how to exploit it. Now you can break it. So it's the same with, um, with malware analysts. So a lot of the students that I taught I used to teach a class, Windows Systems Programming, and an assembly language class. And I had a, a local company who, if, if, the, if my student had taken those two classes and passed them, they were hired as a malware analyst, period. That was sort of the interview. Did you take these with Richard? Yes. Okay, you're hired. Um, now, your SSCP or CISSP, CEH, those are good things to have, especially if you're later on in your career. But for an entry-level position, they're not as important as those sort of low level skills. Um, it is a bit I, of a I imagine if you if you have those certifications, you get to sort of enter at a at a higher level. Like you're you're showing sort of a level of of dependability in terms of your technology that you might not have to be that sort of, you know, signature, signature, signature beginning level. Yeah. Right? Or not I necessarily. Know. I, mean, I would normally arc somebody unless they have previous experience through the same thing. They just okay. might progress a lot faster. Right. Right. Because I'm gonna gonna sort of involve them, you know, in the same things. They have to learn my engine. They have to learn how my system works. But yeah, in a company, if you're if you're walking in, you certainly might be you will stand out a little bit from the crowd. Yep. Sometimes you know, one of the 
one of the downsides of the way we do hiring right now is there's a lot more computers involved in hiring. Yeah. So they may just go, oh, I got 30 applicants. I'll just filter them on who's got their ISC squared, you know, certification. Yes. Sure. And that's a shame because some of the best talent doesn't. Right. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. you know, it, what I look for is somebody who show what I personally look for is somebody who's shown outside interest. Have yes. you shown initiative? Do you, you know, try and get up at B-sides or are you a, you're an active member of local user groups or local security groups? Yeah. Did you reach out to me on LinkedIn and say, I'll do anything? You know, how do I, how do I get into this? Show me the way. And I've ended up hiring some of those people. So mm -hmm. persistence pays off and being curious. If you've just stayed with, between the nice narrow lines and, you know, you went to college, you got your degree, you got all straight A's, eh, that's nice. But right. if you showed some initiative, even if you wrote a paper and it was resoundingly rejected everywhere, talk about that because it, it makes you different. And, and what makes a good malware researcher? Persistence, persistence, oh, and persistence. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, to move on the other side, lest listeners think that malware is, you know, just fun kind of, you know, 24 type stuff where you're cracking enigmas and problem solving. What are some of the sort of like repetitive or, or, or you know, things that malware analysts have to do every day? Because, you know, you you think of like, Oh, I'd love to be a film director someday. And you think, oh, I'm just going to be the guy, you know, clacking the clacking the board. But you don't think about you're up three in the morning, you know, checking fabric swatches and you know, checking two different types of paint and whatever. So, like, what are, if, you know, if if this sounds like a fun job, like, what are the things you say? Well, just so you know, you also have to do this. Yeah. So it's not CSI, right? Mm -hmm. it, you know, right. you're not like the super cyber sleuth yeah. who's going to get sucked into <laughs> some sort of massive story that rotating in the large yeah. <laughs> yeah exactly um but with that so you have to be prepared to look at a lot of malware mm -hmm. and you know depending on where you go it can feel like you're working on a production line or it can yeah. be really interesting so you have to have some sort of plan of what you want your career to look like and you should you should vet your employer Right. What what are my opportunities? So I'm not just looking at a huge bucket of malware every day. Right. So if you're in a large enterprise, I think sometimes it's more interesting to get pulled into breaches, you get pulled into, you know, working with other members of the SOC team, you can contextualize it. There are ways you can branch out. Working in the industry, you know, some of the entry level jobs, you are grinding through a ton of malware. Right. And that could not be very exciting. Um, you're not really paid to you know, to, to demonstrate your amazing understanding of malware, right. you're paid to be able to, you know, get a SIG out and move on to the next one. But this one looks really interesting. Doesn't matter. Can you detect it? Yes. Okay. Move on. Now in a good company, they, we, I mean, we try and find other outlets for creativity and we try and find a career path for the people that want to move on and, and sort of go to the next level. But you should look at the company that's hiring you uh, or be prepared to move after a couple of years. Right. Mm -hmm. So yeah, the boring part of the job can be, hey, I'm grinding through a huge bucket of malware. Right. And and that can be wearing. Yeah. Um, okay. If you like puzzles and if you're in the right environment where you can do some of those next step things, that right. works out very well. But if you're not, you know, I do hear from folks in the industry who get frustrated. Well, all I do yeah. is this. Yeah, so I, I, this, this might be completely off the mark, but it makes me think of like, my friends who are graphic designers and who are also sort of masters of every font face. Is it that sort of thing where you have to sort of like collect a bunch of really similar looking, you know, things like you have to have just like the sort of like, you know, encyclopedia of malware types in your head where it's like, okay, that's this one or that's this one that, and then sort of speeds up your day. It, it does speed up your day, but because there's so much malware out there, you know, it, it really is like that conveyor belt that could go faster and faster. Right. And so we do see fatigue in malware analysts. I see it in my own company, right? It's a mm -hmm. fatiguing job. But I think if you enjoy it and if you're given, it is challenging and it is a puzzle and you, you do run into really bit interesting bits of malware. So provided you have, have the outlet, you know, so you can write a blog on it. Mm -hmm. Oh, you know, dissemble all the way. If you're just measured by how many of these things did you churn through, that could get pretty old. And, right. and that that wouldn't be a long-term gig generally for somebody. They okay. would probably end up wanting to do something else after a while. It is a great way to understand some of the attacker techniques, though. And mm -hmm. because malware now is so so woven into the computer, there's an awful lot still to learn. I, I miss it. I wish they would let me in my virus lab and pull stuff apart yeah. still. 
yeah, it's uh, it, it never stops being fun for you. That's awesome. Uh, so what advice would you have for people who are maybe interested in doing this type of malware analyst, you know, either as a job or career or as a, on a continuum, but didn't get into computer science, you know, early on and might feel like they've fallen behind? Are there ways to woodshed, woodshed your way into this type of work, even if you don't have, you know, a background in, in this area? Yeah, I'd say resoundingly yes. And I want to I want to tell you a story, if you'll indulge me for a minute. Please. It's a, uh, one of my former students, and I'm not going to name him or her okay. uh, to respect their privacy, but I remember, so we'll say him just for, <laughs> just to make it easy. So I have um, mm -hmm. some of you to refer to, and we'll give him the random name, Chris, Okay, right? just because I can see that on my screen. It right makes now. me feel very special. <laughs> so I remember Chris, I remember getting a knock on my door. This is when I was a department head and, and there's Chris standing there and Chris, Chris says, I'm in the blah industry, nothing related to computing whatsoever. I never went to college. I want to join, I want to go and pull, I want to be a, one of the world's best malware analysts. That's what I want to do. I said, okay. And this was a life, lifetime learner, right? Mm -hmm. So not, not a typical student. They'd been in the workforce for you know, a decent chunk of time. And, and I looked at Chris uh, and I'm like, you know, this is going to be hard, Chris, right? Here are, here are the skills that you don't have. We're going to have to get you these basic skills brushed back up before we can even enter you in the... And he said, Dr. Ford, I'm, I'm in. I'm going to do this. I am going to do this. Well, Chris would show up at my office at all hours, make use of office hours. I did admit him to the program after he picked up a couple of missing things. Um, and he struggled and it was hard. And he would be at my door every time I had an office hour you know, it would be the same student showing up. And uh, he went from not so good to good to great to really, really great as mm. he sort of, he just ground his way through. He had every reason not to succeed. Right. And is now a very successful malware analyst. And I think of him or her, um, you know, very, very frequently um, when I think about what can be done, when you just go, no, I'm going to master this skill set. I don't care that I don't have the background. Yep. I don't care that I'm going to have to brush up on some of my more basic skills to, to do this. I'm going to do it because that's what I'm going to do. And so I would encourage anybody, if their heart's really in it, but it's going to require focused effort, mindful, focused effort. Yep. As, as I used to remind students, practice doesn't make perfect. Practice makes permanent. So if you're doing it wrong and you practice doing it wrong, you'll always yep. do it wrong. Right. Um, the goal is do it perfectly and understand every step along the way. And, and I've met many students like that who are living proof that you can walk in to this discipline, knowing absolutely nothing about computing, but just knowing that you really want to do it and go through and come out the other side and be very successful. But it requires one thing of you, and that's persistence. And yeah. being persistent is extremely challenging. It, it's hard, right, to continually have that time over target, to, to sit and be st a lot of A lot of us now, because of the internet, we're not used to being stuck. Right. So in the words, if you can't solve a problem in five minutes, the problem's impossible. Yes. Now, if you want to be a malware, if you want to learn your way into malware analysis and from a totally non-technical background, you better be ready to be stuck for days on yes. some hurdles. But the lesson you learn by getting over that little mountain will stand you in good stead for the rest of your life. Yeah. So what you can do is if your heart is set on it, don't let anybody tell you that you can't do it or that you're not good enough to do it or that you're not smart enough to do it. As long as you just have to take a reasonable assessment of your skills yep. and then put the time in, right? Because is it a job anybody can do? No, sadly, it's not. There are some people who just, God didn't make them that way, right? Right? They're just wired differently. They're not wired the same as me. There's something else that maybe they should, they should do. But um, if, you, if you know you have the interest, you know you could learn the skills. Don't let anybody look, look at you and go, you're too old. You're not qualified. You didn't get the right you know, college diploma. Right. Just recognize it's going to take you time and energy. And I have you know, my set of poster children who went, no, Dr. Ford, I can do this, and did. 
That is an awesome way to end. I'm going to, I'm going to wrap it up here. Uh, but before we go, thank you very much for your time, first of all, Richard. And, um, so as, as we, as we close up, tell me about your work with, with Siren. Uh, what, what services do you provide your clients? What large projects or products do you do that you're excited about right now and in the years to come? Yeah. So, so what I love about Siren is we do good things, mm-hmm. right? So we're, we're the good guys. We're the cavalry. Mm-hmm. Um, we do a lot of work around cleaning up the messaging infrastructure of the world. So a lot of stuff around email security, malware detection and emails, malicious errors that get sent in emails. We have two sides of the business. One is um, called CIS or Siren Inbox Security. And what that is, is an enterprise product that can attach to Office 365 and go into somebody's mailbox and help you remediate messages that have already been delivered, but now you know are phishing. So it clusters them, it helps you yank out 10,000 messages in one go, one button Mm -hmm. click, right? So it's all about giving the administrator more time to do their job, because people don't just wanna you know, mess with that all day. And then there's the OEM side of the business where we build threat detection tools, um, maybe in the file space or web or email, that get OEM'd into some of the largest names in, in the cybersecurity world, right? So there's a pretty good chance that you're using one of our products or that you're being protected by one of our engines and you don't know it. So that's the company. What I love is that we have offices in Berlin, Iceland, and uh, Tel Aviv. And it's a great melting pot of yeah. different people who see the world differently. And I actually love the people. I, I really enjoy the people I work with. I, I've traveled to Israel a little bit before I joined Siren. I've had the opportunity to travel a lot since I've been here, obviously not the last year. Yeah. And it's just been a blast learning about the different cultures and how we can work together and use those cultural differences to put out even better products. Yeah. Um, so that's been a blast. And knowing that our products make people's lives better. That's what we do. We protect people. That's a big deal. So one last question for all the marbles. If uh, our listeners want to learn more about Richard Ford or Siren, where can they go online? Well, for Richard Ford, it's easy because you noted when we started, I've been in the in the internet forever. Uh-huh. My website is malware.org. Wow. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I've there had that you, long man, time. That's, uh, that's what happened. That's the early bird right there. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, I'm easy to find on Twitter, uh, Ford on security. I, I post mainly uh, actually articles and things there. And also LinkedIn, I quite frequently post some thoughts on, right. on the state of the, the world. So any of those places, you know, um, a great place is to connect up with me. I love hearing from people. So, you know, reach out. I, I hope our listeners take you up on that. Richard, thank you for your time and insights today. This was a lot of fun. Thanks, Chris. And thank you all for listening and watching. New episodes of the Cyberwork Podcast are available every Monday at 1 p.m. Central, both on video at our YouTube page and on audio wherever fine podcasts are downloaded. Don't forget to check out our hands-on training series, Cyberwork Applied. Tune in as expert InfoSec instructors instructors teach you a new cybersecurity skill and show you how that skill applies to real-world scenarios. Go to infosecinstitute.com slash learn to stay up to date on all things cyberwork. Thank you once again to Dr. Richard Ford, and thank you all again for watching and listening. We'll speak to you next week.